Um, and uh, under Tanner's direction, Cato launched a project on social security choice, which is widely considered the leading impetus for transforming the soon to be bankrupt system, and I can definitely hear Ms. Michael Tanner's voice in that, um, into a private savings program. Um, he's a prolific writer, frequent guest commentator, we're very, very pleased to have him with us. Following um, Dr. Tanner will be uh, Julius Crime. Julius Crime has, um, well, he can tell you more about himself, he's been involved in finance, but he's recently the editor of a new journal called the Journal for American Affairs. Um, it's a journal that sort of is, it stands out by being associated with a website called American Greatness. Not a no association. No association? No. Okay, so there's, uh, scratch that, all right. Um, but it has taken a, you might say broadly, you might say Trumpist sympathetic point of view. Um, it's a new academic journal, I believe only two issues so far. Um, and so um, he'll be telling you about that. Um, following Julius Crime, we will be hearing from um, Dr. Lane Kinworthy, who is um, in the Department of Sociology at UCSD. Um, to move a little more quickly, um, I'll just mention a few of his books. He does a lot of sociology, kind of political economy of living standards, poverty, inequality, um, economic growth, a number of topics. His books include The Good Society, How Big Should Our Government Be? That's co-authored with a number of folks listed in the program, and Social Democratic America from 2014. And there's a number of other books, but I won't read them all to you. We're very pleased to have Dr. King with us, with us today. Last but not least, we have Salim Ferg from the American, I'm sorry, from the Heritage, that was almost a fatal mistake, the Heritage Foundation. Um, I'll, I'll let him tell you about himself. He's written on various topics. He's going to be talking uh, today on social policy with respect to um, school districts and districting rules for zoning rules for housing. So without further ado, um, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Michael Tanner. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I want to thank the, the Center for Constitutional Studies for having me, giving me a chance to get out and see the beautiful country out here, which uh, I get to do far too, far too rarely. Um, I'm going to try something different today. Uh, it, it's been impressed on me in my last couple of talks about the deficits and the debt that I can be a little depressing. <laughs> I mean, and, and not just a little depressing, but, you know, the sort of thing where they take away your belt and shoelaces before they let me talk. And so uh, I, I'm going to try and be optimistic here. I'm, I'm going to try and be a little upbeat and, and give you sort of a positive outcome here. So, you know, this is new, and if I stumble over it a little bit, I just ask you to forgive me and bear with me a little bit as, as I try to do this, because it's, it's going to try and take this someplace uh, that I haven't done before. But let's, uh, let's see where we can go. So I'm, I'm going to start off with the fact that, uh, which of these do I share? Three of them. There we go. That this year, the federal government will spend $550 billion, give or take, more than it takes in in taxes. Now, now that's actually good news. That, that really is good news. Because if you look at this chart, you can see that just about five, six years ago, we were spending $1.4 trillion more than we took in. So we've actually cut that by about two-thirds. I mean, we're down to just spending $500 billion more than, than we take in. That, that's, you know, if you're a glass half full type of person, you know, that, that's progress that, that we've made. Now, that's a little bit misleading because a lot of that had to do with sort of one-time savings. The fact is that, remember TARP, the Trouble Asset Relief Program, bailed out the auto industry and the banks and some things like that. That money uh, that was basically spent out for that is now the part of it that was going to be repaid, has been repaid. Uh, and actually, if you want to find out how strange Washington is, most of the time if somebody gives you money, you know, you think of that as income, 
And in Washington, when they repay that money, that's counted as negative spending uh, in the federal budget. So I want you to go out sometime and negatively spend your money and see how well that, that works. But, uh, but since we had that, we also had the stimulus bills. Remember all the stimulus bills? Big fight, there was the $800 billion Obama stimulus package. There's actually five different stimulus bills for $1.5 trillion. Uh, three under President Bush, two under President Obama. Uh, they, they're done. I mean, we've run out of shovel-ready projects, and we've re you know, that money has been spent, and that's all done. So when all that comes down, we stop spending that, we come out of the recession, we had a tax increase, we had a number of other things. It all ends up that we're only about $500 billion in the red this year. But as, as good as that news is, it's strictly temporary. And if you look at this chart, what you can see, this is according to the Congressional Budget Office, is that having flattened out, gotten our five down to $500 billion, we're headed back up. And within the decade, we will be back to trillion dollar deficits every year. And from there it goes larger and goes up more than a trillion as far as the eye can see. So it won't be long before right back to where we were uh, five, six years ago. We'll be, we'll be taking in a trillion dollars less every year than we're spending. Now, the deficit is your irresponsibility in one year. You know, you can think about it with your own paycheck, I mean, uh, or your allowance or whatever it is, the money you have. You know, sometimes you spend more money than you take in. You know, the great party on Friday night, and, you know, you, you're in charge of the beer purchase or whatever it is, and uh, you spend a little bit more money than you take in. And look, if you do that once in a while, that's not the end of the world. I mean, that's why God invented credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, you know, but if you do that every week, and every month, and every year, pretty soon you got a real problem. And that's the case with the federal deficit. You know, sometimes there's going to be deficits. We have a natural disaster, or, you know, the Houston floods, or uh, we go to war, or there's an economic downturn, and you're going to end up with deficits out of that. But if you run a deficit every year, year after year, you become profligate year after year after year, pretty soon you got a problem. And the total result of that profligacy is the national debt. And you can see from this chart where that debt is going as well. Uh, right now, we're running a debt uh, that's about 100%, a little over 100% of GDP. That means that our debt right now exceeds the value of everything we produce in this country over the course of a year. Think of it as being that your credit card debt exceeds your entire pre-tax salary. At that point, you might realize you've got a few problems. And it's only going to gr grow from here. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. In fact, in the next decade, our debt just passed $20 trillion uh, a week and a half ago. Within the next decade, it is going to reach $27 trillion, and probably more than that. At that point, you're talking real money. And in fact, if you want to look at it, um, you know, you hear a lot about the debt crisis in Europe, you know, how bad off countries like Greece and everything are. Well, this is our debt compared to the countries in Europe. Uh, and you're right, Greece is worse than us. Yay! <laughs> but we're in worse shape than France. We're in worse shape than Canada, Germany, the Netherlands. We're worse off than Sweden. You know, that's nothing to be proud of, that we can beat Greece. Nothing against Greece, but, you know, that's a kind of a low bar. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I've, I've tried to be upbeat about this. <laughs> and, and, and I just can't. So, because as bad as the numbers I just gave you are, they're only part of the story. The real numbers are much worse than that. See, when we talk about the national debt, there's really three types of debt you need to worry about. The first of these is debt held by the public. And by the public, I largely mean you. You know, if, if you've ever, you know, if you've ever bought a savings bond, you hold part of this debt. 
you know, if, you're, if your folks uh, have a pension fund or a 401k or you contribute to a retirement plan, an IRA, you hold part of this debt. If there's bonds in that, the government bonds that are in that are part of this debt. And about, uh, oh, about 60% of the federal debt is held by Americans, like through their pension funds and all of that. The other 40% is held by foreign countries. About 9% is held by the Japan, 9% by China. They're the two largest uh, holders of our foreign debt. But it's debt held by the public. And economists generally believe that this is the, you know, the, the most solid type of debt because, after all, somebody actually holds, holds it. So that means you actually have to repay it someday. And you have to pay interest on the debt uh, in order to get people to buy these bonds. Now, right now, we pay very little interest. We pay about a 1.5% interest on the debt, uh, which is historically low. And largely because, well, where else are people going to put their money? You know, I mean, if you look around the world, uh, you, know, you know, the euro's got its problems. Nobody's investing in the renminbi these days. You know, the ruble's not a hot investment. Uh, you know, we're the fastest horse in the glue factory. So people are willing to lend us money at absurdly low rates, but if you go back, you know, we're still spending $300 billion a year in interest payments every year. And if interest rates go back to their historic 4 or 5% instead of the 1.5% we're paying now, well, we got real problems at that point. There's a second type of debt, and right now that debt held by the public is about $14.5 trillion. There's another type of debt which is called intergovernmental debt, and this is debt that one part of the government owes the re another part of the government. This is largely the government trust funds you hear so much about. You've all heard about the Social Security Trust Fund. There's a Medicare trust fund. There's a highway trust fund. There's a Gulf oil spill trust fund. There's actually over 100 of these trust funds that are out there. And these are all essentially the same thing, where one part of the government sells another part of the government a bond, and it works just as if you held the bond. Uh, the government eventually has to pay this money back, and it's about $5.5 trillion right now. You add that up, and you get $20 trillion, which is the national debt. So whenever you hear the, you know, the media or politicians talking about the national debt, $20 trillion, that's what they're talking about, is the combination of intergovernmental debt and debt held by the public. But there's a third type of debt that's out there that you really have to pay attention to. And this is the implicit debt, or the unfunded obligations, the unfunded liabilities of programs like Social Security and Medicare. See, we can look out into the future of these programs, and we know roughly what they're going to have to pay out in the future. We know how many people are going to be retired in 20 years, let's say, or 30 years. And we know what the law says you have to pay those people. We also know roughly how much money should be coming in to the government to pay those benefits. We can figure out how many people should be working and what their wages should be. We know what the tax rates are. And you've got money coming in. This, by the way, I understand is called a Brigham Young PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, but you've got a gap. The money's going out, money's coming in. You've got a gap between the two. And that gap is the unfunded liabilities of the program or the unfunded obligations, the <laughs> implicit debt of those programs. It is money that will have to be paid if we're ever going to pay those benefits that have been promised to people in the future. And those implicit obligations add up to about $82 trillion unfunded. It's about $32 trillion for Social Security alone and about $50 trillion for Medicare. So you add those together along with the $20 trillion national debt, and the real debt that this country is facing is roughly $100 trillion. And that's not just a problem in the future. Not just because you, got, you kids are basically going to have to pay it. I get to live on it for free. But you guys... Within 10 years, 
you will earn about $2,000 less a year than you would if that debt didn't exist because of the slower economic growth we will see. Ten years after that, it'll be about $8,000 less. And by 2047, it'll, the average family will be $16,000 poorer because that debt is out there. So not only do you have to pay more to pay back this debt, but you're going to have to do it by earning less money. You will all be poorer because we're living on the credit cards now. Basically, we are throwing a party and having a great old time, and we're giving you the bill. And then we're telling you you're going to make less money to pay that bill back. So that's the problem. What can we do about it? Well, this is not rocket science. If you've got more money going out than you got coming in, there's only a couple of things you can do about it. You could try to bring in more money, or you can try to have less going out. Now, on one side of the political equation, you hear a lot of people talking about, we're going to bring in more money. So we're going to raise taxes. Now, they don't really want to raise taxes on everybody because people vote, and if you raise their taxes, they might not vote for you. So we have to find a small group of people to raise taxes on, so we're going to raise taxes on the rich. We're not even going to raise taxes on them by a lot. We're just going to raise taxes on the rich a little bit. You know, we're going to make Warren Buffett pay as much as his secretary. Well, you know, I could go on all day about the fact that Warren Buffett actually does pay more than his secretary and things like that, but I actually think that raising taxes, you know, we're thinking small. And what we need in Washington is people with big ideas, with huge ideas. <laughs> Not going to go there. Uh, so I think instead of raising taxes on the rich by a little bit, Let's take it all. I want, let's, let's not tax them. Let's confiscate every penny they have. That'll solve our problem. Well, maybe not. Because if you took every penny that the rich earned last year, and by the rich I mean the top 1%, or everybody who earned more than $350,000 last year, if you took every penny they earned last year, that's that little tiny purple box down there on the right-hand side, your, on your left. The blue box in the middle, that's the official national debt of $20 trillion. And the big tall box, well, that's the unfunded obligations plus the national debt. That's that $100 trillion. If you took every penny the rich earned last year, you wouldn't come close to paying it off. So you're not going to solve this problem simply by bringing in more money. What about the alternative? Money going out. We can cut taxes or we can cut spending. We got a new president, new Congress, opportunity to maybe spend a little less. And there's all sorts of things they want to cut. We're going to cut foreign aid. Well, foreign aid is 1% of federal spending. Okay, we're going to defund Planned Parenthood. And, and I know we're also going to kill Big Bird. You know, cut the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. But Big Bird and Planned Parenthood combined are one ten thousandth of a percent of federal spending. You want to know where the money goes in federal spending? All domestic discretionary spending together is, 12, is about 13% of federal spending. That's everything from the FBI to the FDA, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Education. You could wipe it all out tonight. And I'm a libertarian, so I dream of this many a night. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did that, we'd still be running a budget deficit. <laughs> Defense. 15% of federal spending. And the argument in Washington now is that we need to increase it, not cut it. 
I think we should cut it. But that's not the popular position in Washington now. But again, discretionary spending and defense combined are about a third of federal spending. The real money is three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Those three programs alone are 48% of federal spending. You cannot balance the budget or reduce the debt if you're not willing to address those programs. And none of this even talks about the trillion dollars that the Trump administration wants to spend on infrastructure, the tax cuts that they want to, to make, want the largest tax cut in history, about a trillion and a half dollars in tax cuts over the next 10 years. What's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act, repeal, repeal and replace, which I don't think is going to go anywhere. All of which means that the Trump administration basically is not going to cut spending, but they are going to cut taxes, and that means that the deficit is going to get larger and the bill that we're going to pass on to you is going to get bigger. And we know where this ends up. Now, I often talk about the fact that we're on the road to being Greece, and people say, oh, well, there's a big difference in this country. We have a much bigger economy. We control our own currency. We're not in hock to the European Central Bank. It's very different. And they're absolutely right. But I'll leave you with this. This bottom line here, the purple line on the bottom, that is the last 25 years of growth in the Greek national debt. Just start at the, you know, the one end and you can see it rise to its current level as a percent of GDP. The other line is the Congressional Budget Office projection of where we're going to end up in 15, 25 years at our current trajectory of growth in our national debt. See any similarities? Now the average student, we worry a lot about student debt, and I'm sure you all face your own problems with that. No problem. The average student debt in this country is somewhere between twenty and $35,000 when you get out of college, which with interest payments can be a lot. Your share of the national debt plus the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare, your share of that is about $400,000. That's the real debt problem. We've all been living pretty high on the hog, and you're screwed. And this administration like the two administrations before it, <coughs> isn't doing anything about it. And they're not doing anything about it largely because they don't care what you think. They care about people who vote, and young people don't. The likelihood of your voting is roughly the same as your age. About 70% of 70-year-olds vote, 30% of 30-year-olds vote, you can draw a line almost between it and then on down. As long as that's the case, they're going to let the old people party on and they're not going to care at all what you think. So let me leave you with that pessimistic thought and an admonition. Vote and they will care. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me. The last time I was in Utah, I was actually, it was in 2009, it was my first deals. I was advising a company called Flying J, uh, which was a family-owned company. It's a major national retailer. It also had some oil E&P, refinery business, and other things. Um, when I got there, it had gone bankrupt. Uh, it was eventually broken up and sold off to private equity. Um, and I just highlight that, not necessarily as a lesson, but maybe just as a backdrop um, for what's happened to the American economy. Um, fast forwarding to 2016, uh, I think 
I'm not, I know the title of this is Trump and all that. I'm not going to say anything about the administration, um, really, but I do want to talk about um, what, the, what his victory sort of might represent. And one of the things it represents, I think, to a significant extent, is the repudiation of conventional conservatism, uh, the fusionist ideology of Buckley and Reagan. Uh, and if voters wanted to continue that, they had plenty of other options, and somehow Trump won. Um, obviously, foreign policy is part of that. I'm not going to talk about that. That's beyond this talk. Um, but a big part, a more complicated part, a less well understood part, is the weakness of conservative economic policy and economic theory. Uh, in some cases, it's basically just been wrong. And this was in my speech before. I don't want anyone to think I'm picking on somebody. But all of this debt stuff. Um, it basically doesn't matter. I can cheer you up very quickly. The US prints its own money. It's not Greece. Uh, if all of the things you just heard were correct, we'd already be having rampant inflation and be out of control. In fact, it's low. In fact, interest rates are much lower than they were um, basically any amount of time ago. Uh, and Japan has 200% debt to GDP, and uh, they still exist. So uh, I think the conservative movement needs to be more honest about that stuff. Um, and, and admit that, at the very least, these arguments are not nearly as simplistic uh, as they sometimes seem. But uh, more deeply, or on a more profound level, I think the failure of conservative economic dogma can be summarized uh, in, a, in a sentence, really, and that's that we have had rapidly rising inequality uh, along with very slow growth and historically slow productivity growth. Wages have been stagnant for the last 30 years. Um, overall growth has been sluggish through the 2000s. We've basically had our own two lost decades when you strip out the asset bubbles. Uh, and the major economies of the world are in an undeclared currency war with each other uh, and a race to the bottom on wages, regulations, tax evasion, and everything else. And this failed system is the system that we have designed through our trade policies and other things. And it's one that conservatives have been the most enthusiastic cheerleaders of. And a lot of people point to the problems of unemployed uh, industrial workers in Ohio uh, and things like that. And I do think that's a symptom of our problems, but it's not, it's not a cause. And it's not simply that we haven't distributed the gains properly between so-called winners and losers. It's that the gains actually haven't been there to begin with. Uh, and we've basically created an economy that incentivizes financial engineering while disincentivizing uh, investment in re research and development, in capex, and innovation. In other words, since the end of the Cold War, we have basically been undermining future growth and innovation and creating bubble economies uh, where corporate profits and stock market gains are detached from real and broad-based economic growth, which you can look up. Um, I, don't, I don't like PowerPoints, but you can look up the difference between corporate profit growth and GDP growth. And if the entire rationale for your program is basically trickle down, higher inequality is going to make everybody better off, it's going to make us more innovative, more productive, and that hasn't happened. At a certain point, you have to acknowledge that maybe things aren't so simple. Um, let's take, for example, trade policy. For whatever reason, we like to call it free trade. It's really just setting up rules of uh, international transactions and who wins and loses in international trade. And that's not a problem in and of itself or an argument against it. Although I think if you do care about the Constitution, you may wonder why it makes sense to be subordinating American sovereignty to organizations like the WTO. Um, but the more practical and immediate problem, for me at least, is that we've basically set it up so that it rewards profit growth at the expense of both labor and innovation, simply shifting production to lower cost geographies. Uh, it's the same with, and, and, and also uh, incentivizing tax, uh, tax avoidance. It's the same with immigration policy, um, the main purpose, or at least the main effect of which has been to drive down wages, uh, particularly low skill wages. Uh, and we have been told, for example, that free trade is essential to innovation. Well, we've had more free trade since the end of the Cold War. Guess what? Productivity is lower. So where's the innovation? Um, we've been told also that more trade, more commerce, it's going to democratize the world. 
countries that trade, they're more likely to be free, all of this. Well, the main beneficiary of our trade policy has been China, and they're now a much more serious rival to us than they ever were. And uh, incidentally, we started out, uh, and they're no, they're no more democratic, um, and we started out uh, basically telling ourselves that the Chinese just copy, they don't innovate, yeah, they'll take some low-wage textile manufacturing or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. Um, that's no longer the case anymore. They're out, out innovating us in many respects, um, from quantum computing to certain telecom uh, innovations, uh, and they're well ahead of us. Um, and I think, you know, if you take a major conservative think tank like AEI, half of it is devoted to war gaming, you know, military operations in the South China Sea. The other half is telling us that offshoring our uh, high val highest value electronics manufacturing to China is a great idea. Uh, I don't know which one is correct, but both of them cannot make sense. Um, I think we also tell ourselves that innovation is, you know, free economies have a natural advantage and all that. That may be true, but it's not nearly that simple. Compare, for example, the technological achievements of Nazi Germany with today's Germany. It's not a pretty picture. Compare the technological achievements of Stalin's Russia with Yeltsin's Russia. Um, there's no inherent connection there, and, or at least it's a week, a weaker than we thought. And we have liked to tell ourselves, you know, for trade, moving these so-called low-value jobs offshore, um, it's creative destruction, people will get better jobs. We quote Adam Smith as if the economy he was talking about had any degree of similarity to our own. Um, but the reality is most of these people haven't gotten better jobs. Most of them, a lot of them have simply dropped out of the labor force. Families have broken up, they're on opium. Um, a lot of them have gone into the service sector jobs, which are lower quality, uh, and, and that's another reason wages are lower. Uh, so it's just not happening. Um, and I think the, uh, the main issue behind all of this, or one of the main issues, I should say, um, is, is basically this reflexive idea that the state is always evil, and the market is always good. We always have to reduce the power of the state. We always have to expand the power of the market. Um, it's basically created a scenario in which you, we have been de-skilling our, our entire population, making ourselves less competitive in the world, and presiding over our country's decline relative to powers like China, Russia, even North Korea. Um, is North Korea stronger today or weaker than it was 25 years ago? Um, and that's more a foreign policy issue, but still. And it goes back to the ideology. And I think, you know, the question came up earlier, why are millennials less enthusiastic about capitalism? They're the first generation in American history who expects their life to be worse than their parents. Why would they be happy with the status quo? Um, they may be lazy and entitled, but they're not blind. Uh, <laughs> and conservatives have basically nothing to say to this. Um, we can all think of our favorite bad regulations, and we should do that, and they certainly exist, and that can always be done. Um, but there are a lot of other internal factors that we don't really like to talk about. In the first place, as I already alluded to, the financial and corporate sector is actually not investing. It's not doing the things it's supposed to do. For a system, capitalism, that is all about efficient capital allocation, when you have corporate balance sheets basically just stockpiling cash, and the same thing with financial sector investors, this is a sign of a serious problem. Conservatives will say this is just bad government regulation, government's preventing investment. Um, but based on my experience actually in the investment world, and I think it's interesting actually most conservative economic thinkers for all their talk about markets have actually rarely participated in them or done anything with them. Um, it's not really the case. Uh, there's actually significant portions of the investment community that like political risk. Uh, they like sort of arbitrary legal decisions. For example, in the distressed world, they have no problem recruiting investment. Biotech is another one. Um, to give you an example, even in a case like LNG, we have a lot of bad environmental regulations, or at least regulations that don't really do anything and just delay the process. But the reality is we built as many LNG plants as could be supported by the market anyway. Had we approved more, they wouldn't really have been built because they wouldn't have been economically viable. So even in those cases, it's not clear to me that government regulation is really uh, limiting investment in the way that we sometimes tell ourselves. I think what we have seen, on the other hand, is that the financialization of the economy that began under Reagan uh, 
um, and has really accelerated, coupled with the concentration of wealth. I mean, and it, it has nothing to do with incomes, but actually just the accumulated capital and the value that is and power that have come out of that. The top 10 wealthiest people in the United States control over half a trillion dollars of wealth. Um, basically, most of the economic power in this country is held by a few thousand people. Uh, and the issue is when you, you know, as, as, the, as the economies become more financialized, um, most corporations are owned, they don't even know who their shareholders are um, in some cases, uh, and they, you know, but most corporations are owned by shareholders that have no interest other than a sort of portfolio interest, and they don't really care about the companies, they don't really care about um, the competitive aspect of the companies, uh, and they really just care about um, short-term financial profits. And so they privilege things like share buybacks and so-called shareholder-friendly measures at the expense of things like capital, capital expenditures and R&D funding. Uh, and I would say this has a, been a much bigger problem uh, than uh, regulation. The other part of it um, is that the government doesn't always fail. Uh, I know we're supposed to think that as conservatives, but in fact, it was quite instrumental in developing the internet. Um, it participated in the development of fracking. Uh, fundamental research in certain breakthrough technologies is perhaps uh, something that must be done by the government. The corporate sector, the VCs, they want small incremental growth that they can model out and predict, um, but this doesn't really bring the game-changing innovations. Um, I think another a final point on, on that is, um, is just that, uh, you know, another issue is the innovations that we do have, the ones we're talking about now, like self-driving cars. Um, I think we're probably a lot more afraid of them than we, uh, we, we might need to be, in part because um, we, we've, we've basically dismantled our welfare state. We've created a healthcare system that makes zero sense. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's never going to be free market. Um, this is a fairy tale. And, um, you know, as a result, you're going you're gonna to basically unemploy a lot of truck drivers with self-driving cars. What are they going to do? Yeah, maybe they'll magically find better jobs, but they probably won't, just like most people that have gotten pushed out of manufacturing haven't found better jobs. And uh, just like we had to do in the past with other major transitions like this, we'll need a new social settlement, and the government plays a role in that. And that's the point I'm trying to make is basically that shrinking the state should not be the main motivation of conservative economic policy or any economic policy. Uh, it hasn't worked. It actually, conservatives have failed completely to, to achieve any of their own goals when they set out to do this. And the reason I would submit is not because they get captured by the swamp or whatever, but because when they actually learn about things, no responsible person would pursue these policies that don't make any sense. Uh, the last point I will make is just on the constituency um, of the right. And I think, it's, I think the right has been incredibly confused as to what that is. Um, we've operated under this ideological assumption that the market, liberating the market is always good for the, uh, the nation as a whole, the community as a whole. Um, but I think in, in light of recent years, we have to wonder if that's really true. And what's bizarre is that as we persist in this ideological commitment, we're actually supporting people, the majority of the American and global corporate elite, that actually want nothing to do with you. They don't like you. They don't care about the Constitution. Do you think Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos care at all about the Constitution? No. So why are you shilling for them? I do not understand it. I think as a right, as the political right, we have to be serious about this. And this is kind of a low-minded point, but we have to stop messing around with how we're going to save $300 million by cutting agriculture subsidies for the voters that actually care about what we're talking about and start actually thinking about you know, how we're going to fix the deeper issues in our economy. And that may mean increasing state uh, activism. The fact is the only power that the right wields today, since it has effectively no constituency in the corporate community, is the state. Uh, and it needs to recognize that. Um, and I, I guess the other, you know, on the cultural stuff too, I would wonder, is, are, is the state really curtailing free speech? Or is it Facebook and Google? And the right has nothing, um, nothing to say to that. Uh, is the state imposing a culture that certain religious conservatives don't like? 
or is the state actually just running to catch up to where the culture of the country uh, is already going? Um, so again, I think the, the Constitution, I was told to try to connect it to the Constitution. Um, I will connect it very thinly, and that is that you know, the Constitution wasn't about destroying the state. It wasn't about destroying a government. It was about creating one, and it was about creating one and strengthening one that worked. Uh, and I think that's the spirit that we need now, and it's difficult, and obviously you can do a lot of dumb things with the state, but we can't, we, we have to actually try to make the government and the state work, because if it doesn't, then actually none of this stuff will. Thank you. Hold on, can you, uh, let me show how to find mine. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's Thank you, Daniel. Okay, this will work. Okay, well, uh, so I'm going to give you a talk that I take as being considerably less pessimistic than the, the previous two, but we'll see. We'll see what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I I spent most of my career as a social scientist trying to figure out the, uh, the how do I get this to move? Sorry. <laughs> I'll keep you in suspense. <laughs> oh, I have to scroll. Okay. That'll work. That's funny. So I've, I've been trying to figure out for a long time essentially the answer to this question, and I've gone about it in a variety of ways, but mostly by doing a lot of comparison uh, of the United States with other rich democratic, fairly longstanding democratic countries, looking at developments over time within these countries, comparing across to see what, uh, what I think we can, uh, we can figure out. Um, So if we, l let me start with the question of what we want, uh, uh, really briefly. Here's what the Constitution has to say in its preamble. Uh, this is uh, interesting and important, but also vague and subject to a lot of different interpretations. I've tried to, in my most recent project, I've tried to expand this a little bit and uh, uh, identify or focus on 20 something uh, outcomes or elements of a good society that I think many of us would, uh, would say that we want. Um, and the more I've done this, the more I've become, boy, sorry, I'm having a hard time with, uh, with scrolling, which I'm not at all used to. But it's also, uh, Also my fault because I'm skipping over a slide or two. Oh well. Let me just go straight to. Uh, oh, here we go. Let me let me just go to this slide. So uh, I become increasingly convinced that the the best outcomes tend to be yielded by a configuration of institutions and policies that I'm referring to here as social democratic capitalism. 
not the same thing as socialism, although in truth it's not all that far from what a lot of millennials, so in one of the presentations earlier this morning, uh, there was this discussion of uh, how millennials uh, in particular are uh, less favorably inclined toward capitalism and more amenable to socialism than prior generations. Um, and part of the punchline there is that most don't really know what socialism is or are using a different understanding of socialism from what, what's been conventional for at least half a century, if not a, a full century, where socialism refers to pretty extensive, if not complete, government ownership of, uh, uh, of property. Um, what I'm referring to here is a, a, uh, um, uh, a fundamentally capitalist uh, uh, system or capitalist society um, but with three key differentiating qualities. So one is that it has a very extensive uh, uh, and generous set of public insurance programs, a big welfare state, um, uh, as we say colloquially. Um, second, it has an extensive set of employment uh, um, conducive uh, government services, things like active labor market policy, early education, uh, very inexpensive college, support for lifelong learning so people who want to change in mid-career and go back and do something else can pretty easily get access to the skills that they need to do that and even so, some support in switching industries or moving across the country. So that's the second. Uh, and then the third is a fairly modest or limited set of regulations in product la and labor markets. The first two things differentiate this, um, this system or configuration, if you will, from the United States and from a number of, uh, of other countries. The third, the, the fairly modest set of regulations differentiates this configuration from a lot of Western European countries, especially continental European countries. And the best exemplars here are the Nordic nations. I think Denmark and Sweden in particular are useful. Norway has this set of policies and institutions as well, but it's really hard to draw any inferences from Norway because it has all this oil money. So oil, Norway looks spectacular on almost any outcome you want to look at, but you, you wouldn't want to attribute that to necessarily to its institutions and policies. Finland looks fairly similar, but it's a bit of a latecomer compared to, to Denmark and Sweden. So here's a, a chart that illustrates um, the way that these countries stand out. So on the horizontal axis here is a measure of the size of the welfare state, the expansiveness and generosity of public insurance programs. It's just the share of GDP that's spent on all kinds of programs like social security and health insurance, unemployment insurance, welfare as we call it, uh, but also on these employment-oriented uh, uh, public services. And so at the high end, countries are spending between a quarter and a third of their GDP on, on these policies. And at the low end, it's closer to 15%. South Korea is not on this particular chart, but it's down closer to, uh, to 10%. On the vertical axis is a measure of the, the employment conducive uh, public services. So it's spending, it's public spending on services, but leaving out health care and most of education. Not that those two things aren't necessarily conducive, but they're, they're by far the biggest programs in terms of spending in all of these countries, and almost all of them spend pretty similar amounts uh, on, on these two. So if you leave them out, you can see the, the variation across the countries a little better. And you can see the Nordic countries are up there in the, the top right. So big spenders, but, uh, but not just on, uh, on benefits or public insurance broadly, but, um, but also specifically on services that might um, be argued to, to help with, uh, with generating a high employment rate. Where am I? There we go. The second chart has the same thing on the horizontal axis, so a, a measure of the generosity <coughs> of the welfare state. On the vertical axis now is uh, the, the sort of inverse of the heaviness of regulations. There are lots of different measures uh, of this sort of, of thing. This is a measure from the World Bank that's pretty commonly used called the ease of doing business, which takes into account a lot of, uh, a lot of different things, how easy it is to start up a business, how easy it is to close one down, how easy it is to fire employees. And the higher you are on, on this uh, measure, the, the lighter the, the regulatory burden, if you will, or the regulatory stringency. Um, and so once again, you can see the Nordic countries far over to the right, big welfare state, but also pretty high up suggesting, unlike Italy and Spain and Belgium and France, for example, that the regulations uh, are not nearly as heavy. In fact, they're right in the same ballpark as the United States. Um, okay, so what do we, what if anything do we get from this? I'm going to show you a 
a bunch of data. Starting with economic security, um, you would expect, at least those who advocate uh, a generous and expansive set of public insurance programs, that this would help with economic security. We've got one pretty good measure that you can compare across countries here. So take uh, individuals in a society who from one year to the next experience a significant loss of earnings or income, 20% um, or more, let's say. So let's say you're earning 50,000 bucks in year one and in year two you're earning 40,000 or less, maybe because you lost your job, maybe because you took time off to have a baby or care for a sick relative. Uh, became disabled, all kinds of things can happen. Maybe you're, uh, you're an entrepreneur and your business failed. Maybe you retire. Um, on the vertical axis here is the share of households in which when that happens, an individual experiences a sizable earnings loss, a household experiences a comparable income loss. Um, so one thing that can happen when an individual loses uh, some money is that uh, there's a second earner in the household who maybe increases her or his uh, uh, work hours, uh, maybe gets a second job. Another possibility is that there are all kinds of public insurance programs that can step, it, step in and alleviate the burden. Uh, and what you see it on the horizontal axis here is the same measure of public insurance generosity. And in countries with a bigger welfare state, you see a lot lower likelihood that when an individual experiences this loss of, uh, of earnings, the household experiences the same thing. It doesn't get rid of that risk entirely, but it, uh, it tends to, uh, to reduce it. And that's exactly what we'd expect would happen. A second thing that uh, expansive and generous welfare states tend to do is to pull up the incomes of those on the bottom. This too is exactly what we'd expect, but there's a lot of reason to doubt that they'd be particularly effective in doing this, or at least to be skeptical. Um, if you look at a, a kind of relative measure of poverty, which a lot of Europeans favor, um, but is, is in fact much more a measure of equality at the low end of the distribution, maybe in the, in the lower half of the distribution, you see a very strong relationship between the size of the welfare state and low rates of, uh, of relative poverty. But in the United States, that's not really what we, uh, what we tend to think of when we think of poverty. And in fact, in, in much of Europe, it's, uh, it's not necessarily true either. But that's the, uh, the, the relative rates of the official sort of measure. So this, I think, is, is a measure that more accurately or adequately captures what we tend to think about here in the United States. It's a measure of material hardship or material deprivation. So increasingly, governments and, uh, and researchers in various countries are asking um, public opinion survey samples a set of questions along the lines of, have you had trouble paying your rent in the last six months? Have you not gone to see a doctor or a dentist, even though you needed to because you couldn't afford the bill? Do you have holes in your windows or cracks in, uh, in your walls that you can't afford to repair? Uh, is your neighborhood more dangerous than you'd like? Things like this. And so this, this measure on the vertical axis here totals up the share, the average share across seven different questions along these lines that say, yeah, I, I have problems in this area. And you can see a, a weaker than was the case for economic security, but nonetheless, uh, a relationship between these, uh, these, uh, between this uh, level of material deprivation and the, the size of the welfare state. That too, not terribly surprising. A third thing that this uh, that this configuration might uh, might be superior at is equality of opportunity. And here it's. Uh, it's in part the commitment to helping those who are in less disadvantaged or less advantaged uh, homes and neighborhoods, in particular through uh, affordable, um, high quality, and uh, uh, widely available early education, um, uh, but also through things like child allowances and a variety of other goods and services that are provided uh, disproportionately to low income households and households with less educated parents or in less advantaged parts of, uh, of a country. Now, social scientists don't have a very good measure of equality of opportunity, so as a proxy, we often use something called between generation mobility. That's basically how closely your earnings when you become an adult are correlated with your parents' earnings. So in a society with, uh, without much equality of opportunity, we'd expect that your own earnings are likely to be determined very heavily by your parents. If your parents were rich, you're likely to end up rich. If your parents are middle class, you're likely to end up middle class. If your parents are poor, you're likely to end up poor. That's the opposite of equality of opportunity. This measure on the vertical axis here 
uh, is the inverse. So higher on the vertical axis means there's a lower correlation between kids' uh, incomes when they become adults and their parents' income. Again, it's not, a, it's not a perfect measure, but it's the best thing that we can do as social scientists. These data aren't perfectly comparable across these countries. They're the best that we have. They're suggestive that this uh, configuration, this social democratic capitalist configuration in here because of the, uh, uh, the employment oriented uh, public services and on another chart I've got because of spending on early education that they might be good for uh, equality of opportunity. But I think we don't, have, uh, we don't have good enough data and we don't have it for enough of the countries for me to feel really, really confident about this. I, I think it's just strongly suggestive. Okay, so these are some good outcomes, um, but the question is, uh, it always is, and it should be, what are the trade-offs? So big welfare state, lots of spending, whether it's on benefits or services, you might expect that this creates a lot of work disincentives, you'd end up with a low employment rate. Um, what I'm doing on, uh, so I'm gonna show you, I don't know, 10 or 15 more charts and then I'll stop. Um, and now instead of a particular policy like uh, spending on public insurance programs or early education, I'm simply going to show you country patterns over time with the Nordic countries, these exemplars of, uh, of what I'm calling social democratic capitalism highlighted in red. Denmark and Sweden are going to be solid lines because I think they're really the, the best, truest uh, indicator we have uh, of, the, of the performance of this configuration. So very high employment rates, and that's continued through to, to today. Um, and, and you might notice that the United States is in the middle of the pack here, lower than, than any of the Nordic countries. 
Um, those, are, those are a major source of uh, immobility in American life and I think threaten the, um, you know, the, the kind of the nature of uh, opportunistic, mobile, fluid uh, American life. So number one is land use regulation. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly. There's a lot of background here. This is not something where I'm one of the few people writing or many people writing about this problem. We are not building enough housing where it's needed. Um, and this problem is not going to be solved. This is why I talk about a nexus. This problem is not going to be solved easily because of schools. All right, so uh, San Jose is right now showing the world how to have a massive economic boom and not share it with anyone. Um, San Jose, the metropolitan area, Silicon Valley, it's the center of a world-leading industry. Uh, it doesn't just have IT, it has the venture capital that finances IT and it finances other sectors now. Um, so it, it isn't just computer programmers, it's also major finance operations in, in the San Jose metropolitan area. Um, but San Jose's share of the natural, national population is actually lower than it was in 1989, uh, before the internet was a, was a commercializable concern. Um, that is not normal. All right, so if you go earlier in the 20th century, uh, I looked at three cities that, that had similar booms where they had an industry um, that just t took off from nothing and, uh, and, pretty, and had sizable populations first. We're not talking about tiny, tiny places. D.C. and Houston um, began their booms at, at similar relative size to, uh, to San Jose at the beginning of its boom. Uh, they doubled and tripled, respectively. Detroit was already a, a, a very big city you know, when, when cars really took off uh, in, say, 1920. In 1920, it had 1.4% 1 of the national population. Uh, 40 years later, it had 2.3%. Over 40 years, San Jose has, has barely budged as a share of the national population. Um, that's, that's not normal. That's not a, that is not a, a typical state of affairs, and that is arising because of a policy decision, the state and local level, to not build much new housing. Um, it's hard to build up in California because of earthquakes, but it can be done, and they're choosing not to do it. It's hard to build out because of the ocean and the mountains, but there's also plenty of flat land there, uh, and they're not building out. They're leaving a lot of land very, very underused. Um, the result is a lot of people who could get jobs, could get good paying jobs in that area, uh, cannot afford to move there. Um, there's a growing body of research that says this is not just a local problem. Uh, C. and Moretti say that uh, if New York City and the Bay Area had um, median metro level of regulation in their zoning. National gross domestic product, the income of everyone in the U.S. combined, approximately, uh, would be 9% higher. That's an enormous effect. Um, Parkamenko says 2% higher uh, if, if we hadn't changed regulations in 1980. Herkin, Hafohanian, and Prescott, those are pretty famous names, at least two of them. They estimate that if we'd stayed at 1980 levels of regulation, we'd be 9% higher in GDP today. Those are really, really big numbers. Macroeconomists are usually dealing with things a tenth that size and calling those big effects. Um, so, uh, and those are papers that are really about regional reallocation. So those are all about, well, people can't move to this metro area because there's not enough room in the metro area in general, so they don't get these jobs. But on a local level, there's, there's, a, there's something going on inside of basically all big cities. Uh, at least for the big coastal ones today, um, where there's these, these games between localities where each locality is trying to get the best people uh, and keep out the other kinds of people. Um, and the result of, of the strict land use laws th uh, is that we end up with a separating equilibrium, uh, economics term, in high cost metro areas. So in, in DC, we see that in the difference between Montgomery County, Maryland, which is very wealthy. Um, I think it might be the second or third highest median income in the country, and then Prince George's County, which is not wealthy at all. They share a border. You can't tell when you're crossing that border, um, but everybody knows whether they live in PG or Montgomery County. And the coordinating mechanism for that equilibrium is school quality. All right. The reason that people don't want to live in PG County, even you know, right at, right at that line, is that your kids have to go to PG County schools. And if they go to PG County schools, then they're in school with all the other PG County people. If you go across the line to Montgomery County, they get to go to Montgomery County schools with Montgomery County people. And one of the things that we've learned uh, in the education research literature in the last 10 or 20 years is how large peer effects are. It matters a great deal who you're in school with. Um, so you can do some, you know, if, if a school is really severely underfunded, money will help. But at a certain point, extra money stops helping. Um, better teachers certainly help. Uh, getting rid of the very worst teachers 
is a is a sort of a, a serious major proposal. If we, if we could fire the worst five percent of teachers, we'd seriously improve national education. I, I believe those things, um, but what you can you know sort of functionally control, uh, right? It's hard to go out and recruit all the best teachers uh, for a school district. What you can kind of functionally control in the system that we've set up is you can keep out uh, poor kids, and you know this is there's a racial history there. Um, but now it's kind of, it's, you know, I think pretty equal opportunity. Uh, people don't mind if racial minorities who are well-trained and affluent and come from two-parent families move to their neighborhoods. They do mind if um, single-parent families of any color move to their neighborhoods and start attending their schools. Uh, Ludlow, Massachusetts recently hired legal counsel. Ludlow is not a fancy place. Ludlow, uh, median home price is $240,000. But it's a suburb, and it's outside of Springfield, which is a pretty downtrodden Rust Belt city. Um, and so... Uh, Somebody wants to build a 43-unit affordable housing apartment building there, and according to a state law, they have a right to do that. Um, the town hired a legal, legal, legal counsel to try to stop this, trying to find some way that they can challenge the state law and say, oh, no, 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 we really don't want these poor people moving into our community. Um, citizens don't want to deregulate on zoning, on land use, uh, because their home prices depend on the quality of their schools. Uh, and so really, enthusiastic construction only happens down in the U.S. where the typical person moving in is of, you know, higher socioeconomic uh, quality than the incumbents. So you see this in the big cities and you see this in greenfield development and exurbs. But in the suburbs, which is where most Americans live, people are terrified because if you build anything new, the typical person who's going to want to move into your suburb is somebody who's a little bit poorer and a little bit less educated than you and your kids. All right, so the second problem is education. Education is not just a problem because it locks zoning into place. Education is a problem in and of itself. Um, the US, as, uh, as Lane's slide showed, does poorly on these uh, PISA tests. Um, I think what's really interesting, uh, so I got to go to school when I was in high school in the Netherlands um, for one year. The US is a very competitive college system, right? So you have this huge amount of choice, a lot of competition among colleges and all, and all sorts of different markets, and we are far and away the best college system in the world. Nobody comes close to um, matching what we do in higher education. Uh, and for a big, diverse country, that's, that's impressive. Um, Europe has a lot more competition, at least in my experience, at the K-12 to letter level. So there's still public schools, but there's a lot more flexibility in which school you get to attend. So schools have to attract students to main keep in business. And they, European countries typically do better than us there, even though they're significantly worse. And they have much less competition at the higher ed level, where you kind of get funneled into, you know, the, the, the kind of national university or the uh, vocational university that fits your vocation. Um, so we re reversed systems there, and competition seems to help in both ends. All right. Education is used as this class sorting mechanism. Um, we're, we're becoming a country where if you don't have a college degree, there's a huge class of jobs that are simply off limits to you, even if what you learned in college has nothing to do with what you do there. So you're in the right place, being at a university. Um, it's morally ugly, um, and uh, this problem is going to actually get worse as high-quality non-college grads become scarcer, right? Everybody knows now in your generation, this wasn't necessarily true, say, in my parents' generation, everybody now knows you have to go to college if you want a good job. So everybody who can get themselves into and through college is doing it, and that's worsening the average quality of the non-college graduate um, half, 60% of the country. Um, and that means that, you know, from an employer's point of view, a college degree is becoming a better and better filtering mechanism to avoid hiring people who don't have a lot of commitment, have a poor K-12 training, et cetera. Um, so I think the, the, the K-12 education system is very, very um, much of a problem if we, if we care about opportunity um, in America. Um, but education is not going to be fixed because of zoning, all right? So zoning keeps... Uh, you know, people into, the, into these kind of specified <coughs> neighborhoods where we, we segregate ourselves by quality. And as long as the large mass of good potential peers are really happy with their local, um, we call them public schools, but this is a misnomer. We do not have public schools. We have private government-run schools. They're private because they are rival and excludable. You have to buy your way into that school by buying a house or renting a house in the district. A, a public good is one that everyone can access. We do not have that. We have private government-run schools. Um, 
the affluent families don't are not interested in school choice. I don't know if school choice is a solution. That's what conservatives are pushing in, in all sorts of different ways. I am, I, I have a positive you know association with that. I think it's working where it's working. We should keep going at marginal steps. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that is the way forward. Um, the left is, is only asking for more money uh, for the incumbents. I don't see them as having serious reform proposals. So it's the only potential gain in town right now. Um, so let's go back to Montgomery County. Montgomery County has no charter schools. The state will allow them to have them, but they fight them off whenever there's a proposal. They want to protect their local schools um, from competition. They're happy with their schools. The peer effects are good. The, the um, outcomes are good. Their kids go to college. It's not broken. They don't want to fix it. But of course, what that means is that you've taken this whole mass of high-quality potential peers off the market from the schools of choice. So even if you went to PG County and gave everybody vouchers or education savings account to go wherever they wanted, well, they wouldn't be welcome in these local schools in Montgomery County. And they could go to their own private schools, and those might be better. They might have you know, some more discipline. Or maybe you can sort of you know, bring the high-quality kids in PG County together in some schools of choice. But it makes it very hard to say, well, we've got these poor people. They're all segregated off. We're going to do something for them, but we're not going to allow them to mix with the middle class and upper middle class people. Um, so zoning protects a bad education system. Um, Mon Montclair, New Jersey uh, has shot down another affluence of shot down charter school proposals six times, including a language immersion school because it was a poor fit for the town. Um, and then, of course, with the land use restrictions and the high cost of housing, a poor family that's motivated has a much harder time moving to success. And that's a very individual solution. Right? You, everybody can't move to success um, without completely emptying some places. So the, the zoning board protects the school board. The school board protects the zoning board. Um, I think we can talk about solutions, but I don't want to do that here because I want to leave you with a good sense of pessimism, um, partly just so I fit in with my colleagues, um, but, uh, but also because I think this is a real problem and, and the solutions usually assume away significant political opposition. Um, and it's easy to say, well, if we just did this, and it's like, well, nobody wants to do that. And if you're gonna live in a democracy and if we're gonna actually allow people to um, get what they want done through the, the systems of government that they, that they you know, should control, uh, your technocratic solution that nobody likes isn't actually a solution. Um, all right, so that's all I have. I, I look forward to uh, your questions and to conversation with the panel. Thank you. So we will go, I, I'm planning to maybe cut off around 3.25 um, if there's a lot of questions, um, but we're going to follow precedent and allow our panelists to, um, if they want to comment upon what someone else said. Give you that opportunity. All right, let me, let me ask a question about Sweden, because I'm, I'm curious in this. Uh, Sweden in the post-war years was the fourth largest economy in Europe, in part because it wasn't destroyed by World War II. <laughs> uh, but by the, by the 1970s, uh, its share of, the share of GDP taken by government was over 70%. It, it, it had become enormous. And, the, and Sweden had fallen to, I believe, 14th in Europe in, si in terms of size of the economy. It undertook radical reforms beginning in the 1980s. They, they cut back from, uh, from the 70% mark to the 52% mark, I believe, they're at today. They partially privatized their social security system, their pension system. They, uh, they took more private uh, action in terms of the healthcare system, in terms of being a, private hospitals being allowed, private doctor's practices and so on that are being reimbursed. They expanded their, their private education opportunities. So they did a lot to basically reduce the size of the state, and they've grown substantially since then. So doesn't that, in, in essence, tell us that reducing the size of the state, at least by some, at some degree, the size of the state actually does become a drawback on economic growth, and reducing the size of the state uh, is, is a positive? So is this one? Yeah, it sounds like this one. So Sweden never actually got up to 70%. They got at their peak up to about 60 or so percent, um, um, which is quite high. And so today they're at about 50%. Two, 
two things happened. So the, the really big thing that happened is they had this horrible economic crisis in the early 1990s. Finland was having one at the same time. It lasted about five years. And in part as a result of that, and in part because the, the, um, the climate of economic ideas all around the world was shifting, and there was a lot of worry within Sweden and outside it about whether they had pushed too far in the 50s, 60s, and, uh, and 70s. It sort of culminated in a plan embraced by the unions and the Social Democratic Party to gradually shift ownership of companies into union hands over a period of generations, which eventually was shot down, but became sort of the final straw uh, for some conservatives and employer associations. And so in part because of the crisis in the early 1990s and in part because of a shift in economic climate, um, parties on both the left and right um, did agree to, uh, to make some reforms, to partially privatize pensions, to introduce choice into schooling, to uh, and then later to, to change the uh, tax system fairly su substantially in the mid-1990s. Um, and it's quite possible that this is, has contributed to, uh, along with some other things that have happened in the last couple of decades, to Sweden's pretty strong economic performance since then. Um, it's possible that that was just a rebound from a very deep crisis, which was not completely incomparable to the, the 1930s. Um, it's possible that both were true. It's possible that something else was the cause. Um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if government spending at 60% of GDP is too high. Um, I don't think we can necessarily conclude that from one case from a very short period of time. Um, I guess what I would say is that Sweden's held at around 50% since then, and so uh, if, if you think that <laughs> we can infer something about uh, the effect of, of government size on economic growth, then you probably need to conclude that um, countries can go as high as 50% or so and still do, do quite well. I'm not sure we want to, in fact, I would very much caution against inferring too much from the experience of, of one country, but it is one piece of evidence. Uh, a follow-up question for Lane. So I think it's the, the distinction between the continentals, the bigger continental countries, and the Nordics is really interesting. And I'm curious if there's been, has everybody you know, seen this data and, and, and knows that there, what the differences are in, in outcomes and inputs? Have the continental countries tried to copy the Nordics? If not, why not? If so, why haven't they succeeded in getting the same inputs or outcomes? Yeah, the, the, so there's been sentiment in favor of doing this building for about two decades. It was kind of kick-started by the OECD in the early 1990s when it started putting out reports that said, um, look, especially heavy regulations on the labor market, but also heavy payroll taxes, for example, uh, and maybe some other features of the continental configuration um, are causing persistent high unemployment, contributing persistent, which at that time was a relatively new phenomenon in, in the continental countries. So a, a lot of political leaders and many in the population scoffed and said, no, this is just brief, it'll go away, we'll solve the problem, we'll do it our own way. Then another 10 years later, they said, well, things are still okay in most other respects. And, you know, to some degree they were. These are still pretty attractive, reasonably innovative, relatively fast-growing economies. Um, but, but they do have real problems in, uh, in uh, employment. Now, I would say in the last 15 years, the, the tide of opinion, at least among elites, and this runs to some degree across the spectrum, it differs depending on the country, has really shifted. And, and I think there's much more sentiment in favor of, of pursuing a Nordic model. Now, getting there politically, I mean, you can see what's going on in France right now, which is a repeat of what's happened in France <laughs> about every five years for the last <laughs> generation or so. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. In Germany, it happened in, in, in some ways in the early 2000s with a social democratic um, prime minister who pushed it through against what the unions wanted, against what most in his own party wanted. Um, and it, you know, it's had uneven effects. It's still debated, uh, but on the employment side anyway, it's, it seems to have have, uh, have generated a big increase. Uh, anyway, that's a long answer to your question. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, kids, think of other things you want to ask or another. Feel free to just let me know. Um, yes? Uh, I actually have a question about that. Okay, well, you got the mic. You're good. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's gratuitous. Uh, so 
we heard from all four of you some very different perspectives on economic policy and agendas, whether it be kind of the more libertarian, some critiques or viewpoints on conservative policy, maybe intergenerational economic policy and its effects, and also the kind of the Nordic model. Um, we have a lot of debate nowadays in, in our political realm here in the United States, uh, where you kind of have the Bernie Sanders left that does very much so advocate the kind of Nordic model that, that we talked about today. And then you also have kind of the Trumpian uh, conservative economic model that still emphasizes a lot of infrastructure spending, a lot of heavy government spending. And then there's kind of the more classical conservative agenda that parts of the Republican Party are trying to put forward. Um, where can we, as, as many different ideologies and parties, uh, where can we meet? Where, where's a, where's a, a point that we can just agree on somewhere in your eyes, just my, my understanding, whether it be intergenerational or just economic policy in general, where can we as different parties, different groups, different ideologies come together and agree on something that will actually affect positive change that we think we could all either compromise on or just meet together with? I'm, I'm not sure there's a single common point that, that we would all agree on. I, I, I probably, as a, as a libertarian, actually probably have more in common with, with what Lane was talking about and, and that model. I mean, I, I would favor far less redistribution than I think he would and far less social insurance. But I think that modeling some sort of social protection with very liberal labor markets, uh, which is what is basically is the Nordic trade-off, uh, and more trade, more openness at the borders, more all, all the, the sort of, they have a very open economy, much freer economies actually uh, in most of, the, most of the Nordic countries than we do in terms of overall economic freedom. Uh, and and ma marrying that with some sort of social protection is actually a direction I think uh, we could go in, which is very different than sort of the Trump nationalistic, uh, hi highly protected, highly regulated, very closed uh, economic system. That, so I, I think there's probably more uh, agreement there. My view, and I, I think this was clear in my presentation, at least I tried to make it, is that we have to get below the national level and that part of being a big diverse country, I mean, we, you know, um, we may have, you know, maybe we would be better with Sweden's policies, but we are always going to be about as big as the EU, not about as big as Sweden. Um, and part of having good policy, I think, is, is accountability um, and really understanding the, the nature of the, the people who are being governed. Um, and the fact that we can't agree is you know, should not be evidence that you just need to torch the other party, um, which is, uh, I think, the attitude I'm hearing from both left and right in Washington. Like, you know, if only we could really torch them, you know, then we would take over. And, you know, we're seeing the sort of the Senate's um, uh, supermajoritarian principles getting eroded by both parties, you know, over time. It's, it's pretty clear that there's a, there's a, 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 a you know, game, game theoretic outcome of pure majoritarianism that's gonna result there. Um, so my solution is, be serious about state and local. Um, take take seriously the fact that you actually can do a lot of these things. Um, a lot of important policies are actually administered uh, by your states and localities. Um, so as much as you know, uh, y you could do a great deal of um, any of these three models that my colleagues have talked about, and the very different models of, of how to run a government. Um, I think it would be nice if in the U.S. we could have some states that were doing different ones. And then, you know, when you have a one country with a reasonably similar culture, you can actually move around and, and vote with your feet and say, um, regardless of what works better for some big GDP aggregates, I want to be in a place that has these characteristics. Um, and that, that's a very positive feature of our constitutional system. Yeah, yeah I, um, I mean, in a certain sense, I don't know that there will be agreement in a way that the, the sort of fusionist conservative movement of Bill Buckley, I think is just over. Um, it was held together by the struggle against the Soviet Union and communism that no longer exists. The, therefore, the key things that united libertarians and social conservatives or nationalists or communitarians, whatever you wanna call them, just aren't there anymore. Um, that said, I do think there is probably, strangely enough, a greater agreement between, say, the libertarians and myself when you get into sort of more radical issues rather than seemingly more practical issues. For example, on 
the sort of, I think you're seeing, and I think Michael alluded to it there a little bit, but a lot of libertarians are moving to things like UBI now as a better solution for the welfare state. I personally be somewhat skeptical of UBI and would prefer more of like a job guarantee thing, but those are kind of tactical and you know, it, it's moving in the same direction of creating this sort of economic vision where people have a strong welfare state to fall back on, um, but they're still able to kind of deal with the more flexible economy that we're going to have to live in, whether we like it or not. Um, so I think there may be some options there, but I don't know that philosophically we'll ever see ourselves on the same page um, as we might have in 1980. But I guess the one thing I would say is that there, there ought to, we ought to be able to agree um, on some element of, prag at least the, the four of us, on some element of pragmatism. That is to say that, that it's a good idea for societies or because we have a really big country and we've got 50 states and lots of localities, um, uh, subnational units, to try things and then monitor them and be willing to admit when your favorite idea doesn't seem to work all that well. Um, and and I, you know, I, I, I think at our best we've done that well as a country. Um, we can do it in part because we do have, we, we are so large and we do have this, uh, this geographic diversity and, and an element of federalism. Um, the Nordic countries certainly have been pretty good at that. Um, sometimes their parties on both left and right have been pretty rigid, but in many instances they've been willing to, to give up their sacred cows uh, um, because something that they thought wouldn't work seems to work okay or something they thought was going to be great seems to not have particularly good results. Um, and so if, if we could uh, be a little more willing to be more pragmatic and less ideological, I, th I think that would serve us all pretty well. Other questions? Uh, actually, Julius, really quick, could you tell us what UBI stands for? Oh, uh, Universal Basic Income. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a specific question for Charlie. Um, just with regard to the European Sure, so obviously different countries, lots of different systems. Um, in the Netherlands where I went to, to high school for a year, basically any student has a right to go to any school in the country, um, provided they have a seat. Um, the better schools, you know, there's gonna be waiting lists and lotteries or you know, whatever system they have to get in. Um, and you've gotta get yourself to school. Uh, so if you choose to go to a school across the country, that's a small problem, it's a little country. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean we, when we moved there, we sort of shopped around and chose a school that, as a non-Dutch speaker, was really flexible, put a uh, you know, low emphasis on grades and academics, and had a very sort of free model. I wouldn't want to you know, go there as like a permanent thing, but as for a non-native speaker, whereas really what I was doing there was learning Dutch, so it was a, it was a great setup. Um, and yeah, so you, know, you, you get people who want to go to the gymnasium style and learn Latin and Greek. Um, and people who want Montessori educations, and any system is funded by the funded by the government. The, in the end, there are national exams. So, um, whatever model you choose, then if you want to go into the colleges and universities, which are which are, um, I think, much more centralized, um, then you pass this national exam and you sort of get tracked into the school that matches um, your academic credentials. It's a small country, so there's you know, only a handful of universities, and if you're gonna do the classics, you're probably gonna go to Leiden. If you're gonna do engineering, you're probably gonna go to Delft. There's one or two like experimental US style liberal arts colleges that were built as like on the Olympics on bigger universities, but that's like new and radical. Um, so I, and that's not a perfect, uh, probably not completely up to date. This was, I'm very old, so this is a long time ago. Um, but that was my understanding of the system at the time. I got to go through that first process. So my question is for Mr. Crane. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, innovation, self-value card, and how that's taking away jobs from truck drivers and um, how manufacturing jobs have been lost because of, of innovation. Um, my thought on that was that with that, you would, you know, that would kind of lead you to 
for our generation to kind of look for different skill sets or improve those skill sets in order to, to find different jobs. Would you agree with that, that you know, self-driving cars take away jobs from truck drivers, that's leading people to look for different skill sets in order to improve the economy, or would you kind of reject that? Yeah, to be clear, that's a sort of hypothetical outcome. It hasn't happened yet. We don't have self-driving cars deployed in any meaningful way. Um, I was merely highlighting as one thing that could happen, much like the decline of manufacturing, both the result of trade policy um, as well as automation. Um, people haven't really moved to higher quality jobs. Um, but I think that obviously it should motivate people to look – by necessity, um, they'll either have to look for better jobs or drop out of the labor force um, or accept a work job. I think the problem that we've had is that we sort of imagine that this all happens by the magic of the market and that you can't have a, any intelligent government industrial policy um, that can be helpful or that can work. The problem is that Japan and Germany did it. China's doing it now. We actually used to do it. We just don't do it anymore. A lot of the actual empirical research, there's a new thing out called the Atlas of Economic Complexity from Harvard as opposed to the purely theoretical research suggests that in fact it's not so much within, within countries on a large scale, it's not specialization so much as diversity and maintaining a certain diversity of industries that allows for an improvement in complexity. Um, and so if you simply eliminate all the manufacturing jobs, people don't innovate. If they're sitting at home doing nothing, they're not going to innovate anything. Um, but if you allow if you, even if you keep some of those so-called commodity manufacturing jobs around, as the Intel founder pointed out and others, um, you actually have a better basis on which to innovate. And the government can play a role in that. I think probably the only way it does is if we have new fundamental breakthroughs um, that the private sector can then invest in and commercialize, um, and the government will have to play a role in that. So I think, to me, my, you know, my point is not so much that people are going to have to look for other jobs. They will. It's whether there'll be anything for them to find and whether we can actually do anything um, to support that, and I think we can. I'm struck by the sharp distinction between the Nordic model and the West European model as a whole, because in some parts of the world, uh, such a sharp distinction doesn't seem to be made. I'm thinking of countries in South and East Asia which don't yet have full-scale cradle-to-grave welfare states of the sort that we're familiar with in the West. And in some cases, they seem to be turning away from the West as a whole in looking for models and instead looking at a place like Singapore. And one of the reasons for that, uh, as I understand it, I'm not an expert, is that the it's precisely the universal entitlement coverage of all Western models, whether the Nordic or the West European or even the American model, that seems to people in Asia to be simply too costly, too wasteful, and not a real good model to, uh, to pursue. And that reminds me of uh, Mike Tanner's remarks about Social Security and Medicare, which after all are programs that are designed to provide exactly the kind of sort of uh, public uh, insurance, social uh, um, uh, assurance uh, sorts of protections that, uh, that Lane Kenworthy mentioned, and yet they're going bankrupt. And it, we could look, that, look at that through both sides of the telescope. We could say they're going bankrupt because they're ill-designed programs or, or expensive programs, or we could, dis or we could say that um, they're going bankrupt because the taxpayer isn't willing to, to pay enough to fully fund them. But uh, you know, Montesquieu said uh, the best uh, lawgiver is the one who provides not the best laws, but the best laws that the people are willing to bear. And I wonder when we get to a point where we, we just have to admit that for whatever reason, the American people don't seem to trust government enough to want to fully fund programs like Social Security and Medicare in such a way as to bring us to a Nordic sort of level. I think, it, I think it's a very good point, it's, um, and it's a very relevant one. 
Um, I, I don't actually think it's insurmountable. So um, there, there are reams of public opinion surveys of the American population that find two things about how we feel about uh, the welfare state. One is that we don't really trust government in the abstract. A lot of us think government wastes much of the money that it, it takes in in taxes. Um, and yet when people are asked about a, a whole slew of individual programs, they almost always say we're either spending just the right amount <clears throat> or we ought to be spending more. The only exceptions to this are welfare and you need to have the word welfare in the, in the, the question. If you ask about specific programs, you get a different answer. And, uh, and foreign aid which as I think Michael said, or someone said, is a teeny tiny uh, expenditure. Um, so we're, we're on, on this issue, ideologically averse to big government, but pragmatically very much in favor of it. But then taxes are a, a, a different story, and I'm very much in favor of paying for, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I think the, I'm fairly convinced that the evidence suggests that this kind of model does quite well on many of the things that we desire as humans. Um, but I'm, I wouldn't at all be in favor of uh, setting up a whole slew of new programs without any mechanism to, to pay for it. And getting Americans to be willing to pay for it is, is a tall order. It's a different, I mean, it's a different country and it's a different time now from um, when a, a lot of these big spending programs were set up in the Nordic and, and some other countries. Um, and, and so it may be harder. And yet, um, the effective tax rate on the top 1% of American taxpayers is the same now as it was in 1979. Um, it's gone down under Reagan, up under first Bush and Clinton, down under second Bush, um, and then up or under Obama. And so the most recent data from the Congressional Budget Office, which is the, the best place to look for, for these particular calculations, suggests that it's now about the same as it, uh, as it was. Um, in California in 2012 and then in 2016, by referendum, um, the citizens, the 40 million or so citizens in California, agreed to increase taxes, again, primarily on those with uh, higher incomes, in order to fund K through 12 schooling, which has been underfund, arguably underfunded in California. Depends on your viewpoint, I guess, um, for a while. So, so there are there are signs. Um, I think as Michael rightly said, a lot of the sentiment in favor of increasing taxes at the moment is directed toward the rich who do have more money and a larger share of the income than they used to. And there's no way that you can pay for uh, serious large scale increases in spending or simply paying uh, um, to cover the, the debt that we've run up just by socking it to the rich. Um, so I agree with you in, in, the, in terms of the, the spirit of the question, but I'm not fully convinced that you're right. Uh, the, only, the only thing I would point out in, in terms of when we look at Europe is, is to, to make the point that while we think of the, their tax burden overall as large, which it is much larger than the U.S., it is not necessarily more progressive. They rely very heavily on regressive taxes, particularly the VAT, which falls largely on the poor and middle class. It, it, it's not that they're soaking the rich. Uh, and in fact, in some, in some ways, we actually have a more progressive tax system than much, uh, much of Europe does. Uh, their, their tax system is actually quite regressive. Uh, they also have a high degree of tax noncompliance. Uh, basically, if you look at, uh, especially in the pigs, what's called the pigs, uh, Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, Spain, uh, basically the Southern European tier plus, uh, plus Ireland, uh, they, they raise taxes all the time. It's part of the Greek debt settlement, they, did, they had another big, huge tax increase and nobody paid it. Uh, I mean, it's, it, essentially, it's just corrupt as can be. One of the things that, that I think is um, a real challenge to implementing democratic socialism in the U.S. Um, is the sense, the, the, the lack of a sense of um, a shared project around fiscal policy. Uh, and, and you know the Democratic Party has, has decided that their winning message to their voters is that we're going to tax the rich who have gotten their money unfairly and uh, use this as transfer payments for the middle class, which is you. Um, and aside from you know the math of, okay, there's just not enough money there to cover what you want to give, I think that's, that's detrimental to the kind of, um, you know, we all pay into a, a social insurance system. Um, there's a, yeah. Um, so I, I think that's something that we would, you know, 
when I look at, at the, the Northern European societies, um, there just seems to be a very different attitude towards the adversarial or lack of adversarial nature between different um, classes. And I don't think that the approach that the left is taking in the US now is going to give us something like the Nordics. It might give us something like continental or southern Europe, which are much more um, you know, interest group based. There's different parts of these bigger, bigger countries have different regions that are very conscious of their transfers to, to the capital or transfers from the capital. Um, I think we could get that. Um, but I don't, I don't think that adversarial economics gets you to a, a sort of a social insurance model of life. So can I just say one quick thing about that? Sorry, Jules, did you want it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I spent a lot of time criticizing the right, so I'll criticize the left for one sentence. Um, the, the left, even the Bernie Sanders, well maybe especially the Bernie Sanders left, um, most of their proposals presuppose a very strong sense of national citizenship community. Um, so if you want a $15 minimum wage, you can't have unlimited illegal immigration. Uh, if you want high taxes, you can't have open borders full of capital. Um, and as far as the US left hasn't been able to uh, recognize that for a number of reasons, then I think constructing anything like a social democratic model will remain very difficult for them. Um, but I, my sense would be that that would be the larger issue right now than paying for it, um, which would simply be a reallocation of priorities uh, and, and it'd be wise to do that. I was just gonna say really quickly on this question of where you'd get the tax revenue. I, I very much agree. So what Michael said before is exactly right. In the Nordic countries, the, the tax system is essentially proportional. It's basically flat, meaning almost everybody up and down the income distribution pays about the same proportion of their income when you take all cut types of taxes together. Um, the, the big difference from the United States is just the level of taxation. So everybody pays at a, at a higher rate. And of course, they provide all these additional transfers and, uh, and services. And so I've for a long time tried to, to tell folks on the left in the United States uh, about this, that if you want a much bigger welfare state, you need to go where the money is, and the money is up and down the, the income distribution. However, we, we now have a bit of a, <laughs> it's, a it's, it's difficult here in the United States now, and the reason is that a much larger share of the income now goes to folks at the tip top than it did a generation ago and especially in the 50s and 60s and 70s when a lot of these modern tax systems and, and higher tax rates were, were introduced. So if the logic is go where the money is, more, still not all of it, but a lot more of the money is in the top 1% of the top 0.1% in the United States now than it was a, a generation ago. And so I don't think you can go nearly uh, as far as, um, as I would like to or as Sweden or, or Denmark or, or any of these countries have gone just by um, going, going after uh, higher tax rates on the rich. Um, I don't think it's completely wrong headed to emphasize um, um, increasing taxes on those at the, at the tip top if your aim is to, to generate more revenues. Uh, if it's just to soak it to the rich, that's a, a, a different story. Uh, I, I, will, I will caution on inequality though that most of the inequality measures that are out there are a post uh, pre-tax and transfer. If you look at post-tax and transfer, the inequality compresses significantly. There's, there's also a significant problem with the, basically it stems from the, the Clinton era tax, or the, the, I'm sorry, the Reagan era tax reforms that basically shifted how income's reported in a lot of, in a lot of places. There's a lot of money that uh, is now called different types of income and that, that sh shows up differently in some of these calculations in terms of of who gets the income. A lot of corporate income is actually reported on individual income taxes. And, we, uh, and the way it's done uh, with these inequality measures is done on the basically on income, income tax data. Right, so yeah, Jerry Otten had a paper yeah. a couple weeks ago that claimed that 75% of Piketty and size tax, tax data based increase in inequality was just redefinitions. But the 86 one, is everyone recognizes that one, but there are a bunch of other ones underneath. Um, I, haven't, I, I haven't seen good reviews of that paper, <laughs> we, so we sort of still have yeah. to pick it apart and find out. Yeah, I think it's probably doing, stated, but, but it's a point. It, it's a very right. minor issue though. I mean, compared to, for example, if you had most of your net worth in the S&P 500 over the last five years, 
and you had your wealth going up 20% a year versus 14% a year versus if you had if you were relying on wages in which case it was flat. Yeah, although wage again just on this one again wages we've got to be careful total compensation has not been flat. It, it's just been shifting from wage to non-wage compensation when you move into the Yeah, but people no. that are on the lower end have nothing but wages. Gentlemen, um, I have several questions left. I'm sure the audience has a number of questions left. It's been a very stimulating uh, time. Um, it's been kind of a workout, right? So um, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to join me to thank um, everyone here for their presentations. But they will be here. You, if you have a particular question, uh, feel free to talk to them. Um, we thank them for helping us to think about how our <coughs> collective economic well-being can progress or not. Obviously, that's something very necessary to the maintenance of our regime, our constitution, and everything. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And would you please join me in applauding Mr. Lefebvre.